conquered red. You've mastered blue. You've triumphed over yellow. You've caught them all. And now you're ready for the next step. Welcome to the world of Pokemon Gold and Silver. Tons of new Pokemon, new adventures, and worlds to explore. New badges to collect. So you've got to ask yourself, have you got what it takes? Pokemon Gold and Silver, ready to eat for everyone. I've got to catch them all. So not too long after the original Red and Blue games were released in 1996 in Japan, Game Freak was already putting out feelers for their next and potentially final Pokemon title, to be released in the following year of 1997. The game was going under the title of Pocket Monsters 2 Gold and Silver. The game was reportedly going to feature things like Super Game Boy compatibility, a skateboard to replace the bike, new Pokemon, new moves, new items, and even an in-game day and night cycle along with featuring backwards compatibility with the original two games. Now, this was no surprise to some people, well, I'm sure some of the new features would have been considered a surprise. But what I mean is the overwhelming success of the original Pokemon games practically guaranteed a sequel, and with bated breath, all the children of Japan waited patiently to see what would come next in the fantastic journey of Pokemon. And when the year rolled around to 97, they were... Uh, pretty confused when no new game was released. I mean, sure, they got yellow and blue to come in and fill in the gap a bit, but it wasn't actually until like March 98 where Game Freak would come out and reveal that the game had been delayed. Twice to the following year of 1999. Of course, here in the States, this was all meaningless to us, as we just got the first three games and wouldn't hear hide or hair of the sequel till about the turn of the millennia. That's a fancy way of saying 2000. But in Japan, this caused some pretty funny coincidental marketing, such as Johto Pokemon appearing in stuff like the anime way before the games were able to come out. Which, by the way, good thing they chose the gold legendary to be put in the first episode, because the silver legendary at this time doesn't exist anymore. It was this crazy silver lying kind of dude, who honestly makes me wonder if he was supposed to be over the legendary beasts, and Ho-Oh was supposed to be over the birds. Nowadays, we recognize Lugia as the silver legendary with him being over the birds, Though, the funny thing about all of that is Lugia wasn't supposed to be a Pokemon you'd find in the games. It was made to be a movie-only kind of thing, with its creator not even realizing he made it to the games till he saw Silver on the store shelves. Now that is some wild shit, but honestly not even the tip of the iceberg when it comes to Gen 2's development, with all of its wild twists and turns making this a monumental game that was scrapped and remixed into another kind of monumental game. Gold and Silver's development has been more researched and well documented more than any game in the series has ever been. And that's for a multitude of reasons from cut Pokemon being published into official magazines to the demos for the games being shown to the public way before the first delay even happened. Which means we got to see a game that was completely different to what we know now. Helping this matter is a lot of those old builds leaked, which, god, that's probably an entire video in of itself. And, you know, we actually got a lot to cover here, so how about we push that off for another time? Maybe? I don't know, I guess we'll see, because there is a lot here. But to get to the gist of this video... The Pokemon sequel changed a lot over its course of development, and it eventually released in 1999 with a new name, Pocket Monsters Gold and Silver. Yeah, all they did was take out the two, but these games were released right in the middle of Pokemania, so of course they sold very well. Oh, and I mean very, very well. They didn't beat the originals, but damn, they got close. Gold and Silver added a lot 
to the usual Pokemon formula. Including things that carried over from the demo. Yep, yeah, like just something. Sorry, skateboard lovers. I agree, it was a missed opportunity. But at least we got the day and night cycle, though in the main game, it's turned into a full blown schedule where certain Pokemon and certain in game events only appear at specific times of the day or on certain days of the week. The way you keep track of all this stuff is with your Poke Gear, which is kind of like a pager or cell phone which even has a radio that plays music and broadcasts certain shows that can have an effect on your environment or just give you cool items. And it also keeps all the numbers of the different characters and trainers you meet through your journey, which will do things like help you bank your money in the case of your mom, though she does have a habit of buying stuff with your money, but that's the only way to get certain items like evolutionary stones and decorations for your room, so go off, queen. Or they can tell you about the daily swarms for rarer Pokemon. Thank you to my main man, Fisherman Ralph, for giving me all the deets on the Quillfish spawns. I even named mine after him, how sweet. Though you can do more with these characters than just swap knowledge. They can also challenge you to a rematch where they get stronger and stronger depending on your progression through the game. Though, keep in mind, in the original games, you actually have to talk to a trainer after a battle to get their number. They won't just spring it on to you like in the remake, which was kind of annoying, but understandable. I certainly can't imagine playing a Johto without Youngster Joey telling me about his Rattata, though we both know who the real top percentage is around here. Uh, unfortunately, the originals also have a problem of limited space for phone numbers. Uh, this is the PC shit all over again, which is not fixed, by the way! Though, those are just the overworld gameplay changes. In the cases of battles, we got even more! For instance, Pokemon now have... Genders. Wow, right? How progressive. Or would it have been more progressive if they didn't? Huh. Well, this is really just for showing the more natural, animalistic sides of Pokemon, as we'll see later in the series with the introduction of sexual dimorphism in certain species. For now, it's just to flesh out the new breeding mechanic, which allows a male and a female Pokemon of a certain egg group to produce... an egg. Yeah, all of them produce eggs, even the cows and the bulls, it, it's all eggs. If that's too much of a hurdle for you to get over, then I advise you to not delve much deeper into how these egg groups actually work. Seriously, do we really need to have like three separate ones called Water 1, Water 2, and Water 3? Could there really be no overlap or at least a different name? And how do male and genderless only Pokemon like Tauros and Magnemite breed without a ditto? Because otherwise, female Pokemon are the ones that determine an egg species. The male is for the moves. Which is pretty interesting as this does allow you to breed an Electabuzz with Crosschop if you have a female pair with a member of the Machop family. Except it wouldn't actually because this mechanic brought rise to a new genus or genus? A new genus of Pokemon known as the Baby Pokemon. Pre-evolutions to Pokemon from earlier generations. that are also unable to breed, which makes sense, but why only these pre-evos have this condition? It's pretty odd to say the least, and how about we switch topics before I explain Nidoran female's baby form is the only one of that species that can breed. The fuck's with that? Also, legendaries and other, I don't know, let's say unique Pokemon can't breed either. Except for Manaphy, but that's for another time. Hey, wait a minute. Is Nidoran female a different species from Nidoran male? Huh. I mean, I guess, but also no? Why'd they never fix this one? Alongside new pre-evolutions, we also got some new evolutions for older Pokemon as well. Most interestingly being Pokemon like Scyther, Onix, and Eevee getting new evolutions that feature brand new typings. The Dark and Steel types. Two types added into the game to help balance out the power of both dragon and psychic types, especially psychic types. Dark types are completely immune to psychic moves alongside being super affected to them, and steel type resists psychic damage while also pretty much being the most defensive type in the game. The special stat has also been divided into special attack and the special defense to help nerf the psychic type even more. Though, some other Pokemon caught some strays as the new stat spread made them a lot worse to use. Though, the new stats did bring some more diverse spreads to other Pokemon, so 
all in all, a pretty positive change. But that's not all the new Pokemon, as now we have shiny Pokemon. And they are here to waste thousands of hours of your time. <laughs> the idea behind shiny Pokemon is actually based on albinism, or if you're unfamiliar, an inherited trait that causes humans, animals, and even plants to develop an interesting disability that leads to the coloration of their skin to be a lot lighter than what's typical for their species. It's referred to as a disability due to albinism leading to certain health challenges associated with the condition. Though in humans at least, they are able to live quite normal lives, especially in comparison to animals and plants with albinism, which stick out quite a bit in their environments, which is very dangerous in nature. Unless you're a Pokemon, to which it's actually quite the boost to your overall abilities, at least in Gen 2. You see, shiny Pokemon have a 1 in 8,192 chance of appearing every time you initiate a battle, whether it's a wild encounter or even a static one like legendaries. These Pokemon usually have a different color palette compared to their usual one, though in some cases it's unfortunately undistinguishable. Seriously, between these two, can you tell which is shiny? No? That's because they both are! But fortunately, in a lot of cases, they do carry an interesting or at least unusual palette, which can be fun for bragging rights or your own personal collection. Though in Gen 2, they can actually have higher stats than most Pokemon of their species. But like, also, according to Boopedia, they can't have the maximum stats of their species. I, can't, I really can't find really all that much information on this, but basically, in Gen 2, your shiny Sunkern is stronger than most other Sunkern, but not all Sunkern or something like that. Though that's not the only new mechanic that affects stats, as we have Pokerus. Pokerus. Half of you just went, what the fuck is Pokerus? And I don't blame you, as this is way rarer than any type of shiny in the series, with a staggering 1 out of 21,845 chance of appearing. And in my, like, what, 15 plus years playing Pokemon? I can only think of, like, one, maybe two times I've had a Pokemon contract the disease. Okay, so you know influenza, right? The flu? The debilitating disease that we as humans just can't seem to get rid of? Well, in Pokemon, they have Pokerus. And like Pokemon albinism, this shit is actually really, really good. As it allows your Pokemon to earn double the stat boosts and experience gained from battles as long as they don't faint and the battle is won. Which is really good on one Pokemon. But this shit spreads like wildfire in the PC and the party. It doesn't last forever, only up to like 4 days if you're lucky. But you can evenly spread the virus around your party and PC to pretty much incubate and breed the virus like it's some sort of fucking umbrella project. In games like Fire Red and Leaf Green or Colosseum and XD, you can keep a Pokemon with the virus indefinitely due to their lack of time-based mechanics. And did you know this shit is in real life as well? Well, not exactly like Pokerus, but there are mutualistic viruses like the kind of bacteria that lives in the human gut, which is able to digest all the stuff that we can't, which is really, I, don't, I think that's pretty interesting. What? What, what? what, are you surprised I'm busting out the big words and the science in a Pokemon video? Look, we can talk about Pokemon's quality as a game series all day. But I have learned way more about certain sciences and like myths from Pokemon than any class I've ever taken, if we're being honest. Though, speaking of sciences, meteorology. Yeah, this game was the one to introduce the weather system into Pokemon. Starting with the main four, technically five, we have clear weather, which is just the base state of the game and as such doesn't really favor any certain typings. Rain, which boosts water type damage moves by 50% and lowers fire type damage moves by 50%. Sunny, which boosts fire type damage by 50% and lowers water type damage by 50%. 
Hail, which damages all non-ice types 1 16th of their health every turn. Sandstorm, which pretty much does the same as Hail, but for rock, ground, and steel types. Though from this gen onwards, we'll see these different weather patterns gain more effects, like Sandstorm boosting special defense for rock types in gen 5 onwards. Or Snow, which doesn't do damage like Hail, but it boosts the defense of ice types. Wait, why does Sandstorm only boost rock Pokemon? Like, is sand not a ground thing? Truly, what is the dividing factor here? I swear, every time I look into the type chart, I feel more and more strongly that these two and steel might as well be the same type. Like, really, how many times have you confused the three for one another? I sure have. But we aren't done, as these different weather effects actually give special boosts to certain moves like Solar Beam, which works similar to Hyper Beam, except the charge is before the attack. Unless Sunny Day is out, which allows the beam to be fired without any downside effect on the user. Or moves like Thunder and Blizzard, which become 100% accurate if Rain or Hail is set up. These weather effects don't play a huge role in Gen 2, but from here on out, they become one of the most interesting mechanics in Pokemon due to how creative and versatile they can be in different trainers' battle strategies. Speaking of... Held items, which are basically items that can be equipped to a Pokemon which give certain effects or benefits, such as the pink bow or silk scarf after Game Freak thought it was too girly, which 1. Pussies! 2. Can increase the power of the holder's normal type attacks. Now, not all items are good held items, as most man-made objects like potions cannot be used by a Pokemon. Unless they're like a button or a bulletproof vest, those are just fine. Though, I think the game is meaning that things like potions are just too complicated for an animal. So if you want an item that heals a Pokemon or gets rid of a status affliction, you need food, like berries or garbage or... What the fuck? And that's where these little trees come in. Uh, at least for the berries. As these can either give you a berry, which can heal a variety of different afflictions, or they can give you an apricorn, which are these weird little colored nuts that you can give to this old guy to develop some specialty Pokeballs. Which is cool when they work as instructed, like the heavy ball, which helps you capture heavy Pokemon, or the friend ball, which makes a Pokemon friendlier but a lot of these balls don't work at all in the original games, like the Moon Ball, which is supposed to be good at catching Pokemon who evolve through the Moon Stone. But in the code, it's said to being good at catching Pokemon who evolve through Burn Heal. None of them do that, so it's just a cooler Pokeball. Or the Love Ball, which was made to help catch the Pokemon of the opposite gender. But it actually does the opposite instead. How progressive, though! This was designed with breeding in mind, so yeah, it's a dud. And speaking of duds, this bitch. We'll get to her later. Though, segueing from that, kind of, how's the new Pokemon? A lot of the new Johto Pokemon feel like an extension of what they already did in Kanto, just a bit more goofier and colorful, which I think was the correct choice giving Johto some of its own feel compared to the Kanto decks, at least in some areas. Alright, look, like the rest of the region, the Johto decks has this really unique problem. It doesn't really feel like its own thing in some areas, and you know, that's for a variety of reasons. For one, most of the new Pokemon are just flat out unavailable till post-game, or like in one specific area leading to a lot of people to just not encounter things like Slugma or Skarmory to the Gen 3 games, which is why a lot of fans think they're Hoenmons. Or Togepi, whose majority of on-screen time was in the Kanto TV series, and it barely is in its own games outside of like one gift egg. Not helping matters is that a large portion of the decks is being tied to Kanto, through the evolutions and the pre-evolutions, and most of that is not its fault. Like, most of these guys are holdovers from the beta of Kanto, which is why they are technically able to be transferred to the original games. Sort of, it's a missing no situation, but still, we can get into, you know, the Johto identity stuff, you know, later. 
but like a lot of the new Johto Mons are kind of ass battle wise. I mean, they're, they're a huge reason that every time a new evolution or forms are brought up, Johto is at like the top of the list of new shit needed. And I can't think of a single time where one of them got something new and it didn't immediately turn them into a top tier Pokemon. Maybe do Dunsparce, but that maybe is huge. And what's also huge is that the fact that there are still some Mons in here who desperately need the help. The shit with Sunflora is just unfair. Like, my god, Game Freak has the perfect fire-grass-type combo design, like, of anything, and they just refuse to do anything with it! Mega New Evolution, a fucking Z-form, please! The starters, Chikorita, Cyndaquil, Totodile. This is the hardest starter choice for me, bar none. When I was a kid, it was Chikorita all the way. I was a grass starter only man for like a good while. Nowadays, I kinda lean towards Cyndaquil because of this one playthrough of Soul Silver I did where I kept it a Cyndaquil the whole game and it was so cute. I love that Pokemon. And then Totodile? He's just fucking cool. It's always a pain for me to choose. Like what a perfect bunch of starters. Though man, they are just kind of like, plain, you know? Like the three don't really have anything that makes them crazy unique from other starters. They lack the, they lack the sauce, y you know what I mean? Like Typhlosion, it's just a better Charizard right down to the stats being the exact same. But it never got recognition for that. I'll defend Meganium as a wonderful Pokemon and trust me, we'll get to that later but it too is just another bulky defense mon like Venusaur. For Alligator is cool and his name's kind of funny because they didn't have enough space to spell out Gator, so they just kind of did this bullshit. But like, it's just kind of a decent water type. These guys really need something to spice them up, like a secondary typing or something. Like, Typhlosion was basically the volcano Pokemon till Camerupt came in and took that spot. Also, Entei, but eh. So, I don't know, maybe lean into that a bit more and give it the ground typing. That would have made a top-tier offensive powerhouse. Or do something crazy and make it fire ice. Beta Cyndaquil was an ice type, and that combo is extremely unique. Even to this day, modern Pokemon only has one that's that typing, and it's a form change. Plus, this comic about the Typhlosion Sneasel crossbreed... That man, that's so cute. Like, if that was a real Mon, I'd probably cry. I love Meganium as this really fun, pure grass support. But man, would it do its job way better if it had a secondary typing. Like, Psychic to go with Reflect and Light Screen, or fucking Dragon, that would have been badass. Or in modern games, Grass Fairy. That shit would be untouchable. And for Alligator has all these caveman themes and martial arts equipment designed into his evolutionary line, fighting would have fit perfectly for these two. Or Dark, since they use a lot of biting moves already. Or screw it, just give it Dragon! Now that would be some power. I think Hisuian and Typhlosion really fits what I mean here. Sure, I don't like it more than regular Typhlosion, but you have to admit, it, it's got the sauce compared to plain Jane over here. I can't think of a better term. I just see these two, and I think to myself, this one has a more bulky design, but he's sauceless compared to this. Mm -hmm. Not to date the video, but Legend ZA is not out for me yet, so I don't know if they do anything with these two, but I hope it does. I love them. I truly think this is my favorite trio of starters. I just think they could be a bit more. But my favorite Pokemon of this gen, especially design-wise, is very tough for me to choose, because I love Tyranitar. I love me some Kaiju like Gojira, and this bitch is just him. But like, so much more, I love Tyranitar. I really, really do. And I don't think I had to explain why I like him so much. Look at him! But man, 
Steelix is the coolest fucking Pokemon. Like, really, it's this giant steel worm. And I don't mean worm like worm, I mean worm like verm. And it can fly. It's so badass. Like, you gotta understand, when I was a kid, I saw Onyx, and my first thought was, holy shit, big rock snake. And when I saw Steelix, I got hard. Hard. <laughs> Onyx is a really odd Pokemon, because it's like made in Gen 1 to be the perfect first boss fight. There's a whole video about it, and it's really good. But basically, it's typing, and it's high defense made it an intimidating battle. But outside of that context, it's just kind of ass, which I think is stupid. Onyx should have been able to have its cake and eat it too. And Steelix is basically that with its wider move pool, better offensive stats, and the fact that its defensive skills are second to like one or two other mons. Steelix is so damn cool. And if I could have a Pokemon in real life, Steelix would 100% be my choice. Not only can it fly, it has a large, strong body that makes it the ultimate guard dog, because nobody's fucking with a guy with a giant iron worm. And besides that, you could do a whole construction company with just a Steelix. These guys would be amazing in any sort of natural conservation effort, with moves like Rotiller and the fact that there are large, bulletproof bodies. You could allow them to guard almost every extinct species and those less fortunate. He's goaded. And his mega form is all that, and it sheds diamonds. So infinite money. I love Steelix. He's so cool. He's not my favorite, but he's top three. I, I fucking love this Pokemon. Though, before we move away from gameplay, I guess I should bring up this odd problem with Johto, you know, the Johto games as a whole. The level scaling. I mean, as you go through the game, a lot of wild Pokemon and trainers aren't properly proportioned correctly to the player's level, either making them far too weak to train experience from, or being far too strong for the player to be expected to defeat. The game stays around the level 20s just far too long than any other game in the series, with most of the battles before endgame being in this range and even after it which leaves the player to kind of have to grind to get up to the level of certain bosses. The gym leaders are a great example of this. The first one, Falconer, doesn't even reach double digits. Whitney has a Pokemon that's frankly too strong for the majority of underleveled Pokemon surrounding it. The fifth gym leader, Chuck, and the seventh gym leader, Price, have teams that are in the higher 20s, which we've been fighting since the fourth gym with Morty and the 8th gym just whips out a level 40, which is just way higher than any wild encounters or trainers around her, the levels should be gradually increasing with each stage of the adventure. That way the player doesn't have to waste time grinding up Pokemon for hours to beat the next gym. Good level scaling should happen naturally, and frankly, it should be unnoticed by the players. Grinding should be required if the player has been slacking off in their training. It's a punishment, not a requirement. And that's coming from somebody who doesn't mind grinding in RPGs. Like honestly, every time I play Final Fantasy 1 or Pokemon Diamond, there are spots where I take the time to have a little training arc, because honestly, I think grinding can be a satisfying experience. At least in some sense. But to have it be required due to poor planning of the game's structure is unacceptable. I said before that I think the Elite Four and Pokemon are better fights if they have a higher level advantage. And I think that goes the same for Gold and Silver and even Crystal. But I think Claire having 40s is kind of unacceptable when all the player has battled up to her were level 20s. And this problem sadly expands into the post game. Spoilers for whoever doesn't know this, but the Johto games have a second region for you to explore, and all the wild encounters and trainers are using level 20s while you and the bosses are in the 40 to 60 range. I don't know how you mess this up this bad, because as soon as you grind up to be the level of the gyms, they're a fucking cakewalk, so it really is just the level scaling that's the problem. It's not the strategies these trainers use, well, 
except for Whitney's sort of I don't think she's that bad but when she gets on a roll she fucking stays on it and that's hard to compete with an oddish let's just be real here though if you did pick Chikorita it is kind of nice to have an advantage over her after the first two gyms tore you to shreds fuck some would blame the scaling on how open the game is but I find that a poor excuse Kanto was extremely open-ended in its gym order and the game didn't have any problems when it comes to level scaling. In Johto, you can go to three gyms in whatever order. In Kanto, you can do five. Literally, the majority of the game is up to your own discretion. Now, a modern take in the community on the Johto level scaling issue is that it has to do with the fact that the game is not meant to be played like a marathon like the other games. And that instead, it's meant to be played as like a casual life sim? or at least the RPG equivalent, where you spend most of your time in game doing different daily tasks and activities, slowly growing a bond with your team, and just having fun fishing, bug collecting, doing radio quizzes, calling your friends on the Poke Gear, daily rematches, gambling, you know, cause it's 90s. But I don't think I agree. I know exactly where you're coming from. With all those in mind, it's very easy to play these games that way. Hell, I kind of did, at least when I played Gold. And I found that the game does reward the player taking their time, especially if they backtrack across the region, because more areas do open up as you play through the game. Friendship with your Pokemon is a whole ass mechanic in this game. You are incentivized to stop and smell the roses, but I... Like, I can't co-sign the idea that this game is meant to be played like Animal Crossing. For one, the game doesn't tell you any of this stuff. Like, if you're supposed to just relax and take everything in slowly, I don't think the game would push you like they do. Villains like Team Rocket don't really fit in with that kind of game. It's hard to relax and watch the flowers bloom when some mafiosos are putting chemicals in the water that turn the freaking fish into blood-soaked dragons! That doesn't fit very well together. And two, I think the reason the game is as chocked full as it is was because Game Freak wanted this to be the ultimate Pokemon experience, which meant everything in the kitchen sink had to be added. Why did they want this to be the ultimate experience? Well, Game Freak believed gold and silver may be the end of the series, and they wanted to go out with a bang, and in a sense, I can respect that. These games started development before Gen 1 had really taken off, so I can see why the smaller company had doubts as to if their game would have succeeded or not. It's not like they had a series before or after Pokemon that really reached these levels of profit or popularity. If you play these games like a life sim, I get it, and I think they can be fun when played that way, but I don't believe that was the intended method. And I, even if they were, I don't think that excuses the level scaling in the slightest. But enough about gameplay. How's this game look? Beautiful. I'm gonna say this right now. If Let's Go is my favorite look, then Gen 2 at least is in my top 3. I can't explain it, but the 8-bit sprites with their vibrant yet limited color palettes just look so good. I don't think this is a hot take, like, at all, as a ton of the different indie projects or fan productions constantly return to this style of Pokemon. And I get it, again, it's stupid colorful. And I love the new legible sprites and the version exclusive Pokemon sprites. The iconic special effects. Oh, Arceus above, man, this shit is so good. Okay, hold on, this might be a hot take, but this shit is so good they could have kept the rest of the series like this all the way to Scarlet and Violet. <laughs> that may be too hot. Oh, I spit that out as soon as I put it in my mouth. But I also don't disagree with that statement. I love this look. Except for the battle backgrounds. I think the pure white would have just had to go, but they can, they can keep this style going. Music-wise, a lot of it is just remixed from the original games, but then again, we got plenty of new tracks inspired by ancient Japan. And I know I didn't get too deep into music last time, but I think that's fine that I didn't. Because Pokemon music is literal perfection. Pokemon and Sonic both have this one rule. Even if the game is hot, stanky ass, the music almost never is. And I respect that dedication so much. 
which brings me to Johto as a region. The Johto region itself is based on the real-life land of Kansai, which, like Johto, actually does neighbor the land of Kanto. As Bulbapedia puts it, it represents the harmony of contrasting cultures living together. Compared to the modern Kanto, Kansai is linked to the past and is known for its historical temples, shrines, palaces, gardens, and architecture. And you can clearly see that if you play the game. Unlike Kanto, which had all the sprawling metropolises, Johto is a lot more quaint, homey even. With a lot of older Japanese architecture and history found in all of its little different shrines and ruins. Like really, these things are like everywhere! Either built in monument to a certain legendary Pokemon, or just for people to relax and learn their history in. I'd say there is a shrine here for every skyscraper over in Kanto. Johto is very much tied to its past, and that counters a lot of the modern stuff in Kanto very well. Which brings me to something that I think's kinda odd about Johto, and that's how it was made without a certain theme in mind. In the last video, I went into great detail about Kanto and how it has a lot of themes, including nature versus technology, and what it truly means to win by your own means without trying to cheat your way to the top. Think Red and Giovanni. You know, the main thing in your face about the game, the theme? Like, Hoenn has a frankly pretty interesting theme about climate change and what our place is within the ecological balance. Sinnoh has a lot of religious themes to it. Unova is very much about our dreams and the realities that come into conflict with them. Kalos is all about life and death and how trying to disturb that balance between them can cause untold bouts of destruction and misery, even if your intentions are good. Johto? Uh, I mean, Lugia and ho you know, the box art legendaries, kind of work well with the rain and sunny weather, but they didn't really focus on that too much, and that kind of went to Groudon and Kyogre in the next games. Well, Johto also added the day and night mechanic, and in certain texts, it says Lugia is like the moon and ho is the sun, so... Nah, I don't really feel it either. Uh, oh! Maybe it's like yin and yang, light and dark, hot and cold, winter, summer, male, female, lizard, bird, monotone color, no? Kinda? Look, a big reason behind this lack of an overarching theme is because of the box art legends. Lugia and Hoho -Ho were made by completely different people for two different purposes. They have genuinely nothing to do with one another, but there is at least some sort of theme past and future. Really, that's what the devs have theorized, so no, not canon, but this is probably the closest theme if you ever wanted to add one to them. You see, Lugia can get ancient power by level up, and Ho-Ho -Oh gets future sight. Lugia represents the monotone past of the series, and Ho-Ho -Oh represents a colorful future. One half of the game features more classic styled architecture, the other more modern. And Celebi, the new mythical, is able to travel between the past and future. Hell, when you trade with the old games, you literally use a time machine to do it. But then again, this is also just kind of eh? Again, this does kind of lead me back to a certain problem I had with Johto, but I think we'd probably be better off saving that towards the end of the video. So for now, I'll just say as a region, I do really like Johto. And it's fun to see how it started, or at least inspired, a lot of other themes that we'll see later in the series. But with all that, it's time for story. Two years after the original game's journey, we now inhabit the body of a new kid named Gold. A brand new trainer tasked by this game's professor, a man by the name of Elm, who's still a bit salty for not being the one to welcome Gold into the world. But anyway, Elm tasks Gold to run an errand for him, and in exchange, Gold gets to choose one of three starter Pokemon. After doing so, Gold heads out into the world and runs said errand, bringing him in contact with Mr. Pokemon, a self-proclaimed Pokemon fanatic, and the self-proclaimed world's leading researcher of Pokemon, Professor Oak. The old men give him a Pokedex and a thank you to pass on to Elm, but before he makes it back to the lab, he's interrupted by an urgent call by the professor, telling him that somebody broke in and stole a Pokemon after we left. We soon meet up with the thief and learn that his name is Silver, but we'll get to him later. But after returning to the lab, Elm tells us that we might as well begin our Pokemon League challenge and to aim for the top. 
And just like the last game, we travel across the Johto region, conquering each and every gym, only stopped by our own need to help those in need and to prevent a revived Team Rocket from... eating Pokemon. I guess all the regular animals went extinct. Though, to be honest, I could kind of go for a slowpoke tail. I bet it tastes like Canadian bacon, which if you haven't had it, it's pretty much just an unsalted ham. Which, I know, kind of sounds gross, but you can cook it pretty well. What are we talking about? Oh, right, we're here to prevent a revived Team Rocket from taking over the region. Luckily for us, though, we don't have to do it on our own, as the Elite Four member turned champion Lance has come to aid us on our Jesus Fuck, dude! A little much, don't you think? Just hyper being demanded point blank. Kinda wish I could do that to someone in particular. But we follow Lance into the depths of the rocket base, coming across the new ringleaders of the Team Rocket organization. A bunch of nameless admins. We'll get their names later in the series, but for now, they're just a bunch of basic bitches. Who have this master plan of bringing back Giovanni by sending him a message while also controlling the minds of all the region's Pokemon through the power of radio waves. Ooh. Sure, the message I get, but the mind control part, I, I don't know, even their little test at the Lake of Rage didn't really control the magic carp. It kind of just pissed them off, so I'm not really sure if this radio plan would have worked. And on the Giovanni end, the old boss just completely ignores the call to action due to him still being off training like he promised Red. So, um... Yeah, this plan's kind of moot. But the Neo Rockets are dedicated, so they stick to their master plan, and Gold sticks it to them, ruining their operation. And as a reward, the director of the radio tower hands us a wing depending on our version, which grants us access to the box art legendary, which in our case is Ho-Oh. Though that's not the only legendary we're able to capture, as the new legendary trio is here to cause a lot of headaches. The Legendary Beasts. Theorized to be three evolutions that perished in the Burn Tower disaster that the legendary Ho-Ho brought back to life, which is a lot clearer in the beta version. After discovering them in their old gravesite, the three dash off into the unknown. Uh, no, not you. Becoming a side venture for the player to hunt down and capture if you so choose. And I do mean choose, because this is the introduction of roaming legendaries! Basically legends that appear randomly in different sets of tall grass all around the region. And when you manage to encounter one, they do everything in their power to run away. Oh, <laughs> more safari zone shit. Honestly, it's a fine gimmick, especially if it's in the later games where tracking them is a lot easier. But really, just save yourself the headache and use the master ball on these dudes. At least, that's my strat anytime I actually want to use one. Though, I do want to bring up how all the legends in these games are actually side quests. Even Ho-Ho and Lugia are purely up to your own discretion. Which, I actually like, like, a lot. It makes it feel more special whenever I decide to actually hunt one of these beasts, or do Ho-Ho or Lugia's dungeon. It makes it feel like I'm actively seeking out the challenge of capturing them, and not some mandatory checklist item. Oh, we can get to that later. For now, it's time for us to head to the City of Dragons, where we have to battle the final gym leader, Claire. Who's supposedly Lance's younger cousin who's so strong she can hold her own with the Elite Four. Which is probably why she's beyond pissed that we managed to beat her. And she claims this match to be fraudulent, only giving us the badge if we pass a trial in the nearby Dragon Cave. This trial supposedly being an impossible test of will, where we must scowl the draconic nightmare to find a mythical artifact known as the Dragon Fang. It was just lying on a rock behind like one whirlpool in a region where there's a whole HM designed to deal with whirlpool. I can't believe you were able to actually girl please. I can see why this was replaced with a quiz in the revisions. This right here is just embarrassing. Though the quiz isn't really that hard either, as there's really no way to fail. And no matter what, you get a little dragon friend for your troubles. Though if you answer kindly, the dragon can go light speed. Which is pretty cool. With the last badge down, we can head back home to check on Mom and the Professor before heading on to the Pokemon League. 
but on the way we are informed that the new route we surf to is actually in the Kanto region. That's right, we are back to Kanto from last time, with Johto and Kanto apparently sharing an Elite Four in Champion. Though we could probably guess that due to us meeting Champion Lance earlier. With that, we head through Victory Road, this time with no Boltress, but we do get to see this asshole. After that, we finally make it to the Pokemon League, where we meet the new Indigo Elite. Will, a trainer who specializes in psychic type Pokemon. Though you wouldn't be able to tell that from his room, I guess he didn't have enough time to change things once Lorelei left. Though that does actually bring me to something. A lot of people actually believe there to be a connection between Lorelei and Will. Due to their hair color, Pokemon choice, and the fact they both represent the first challenge of the Indigo League, some believe that Will is actually a post-transition Lorelei, which is an interesting theory, and technically it does have evidence in the... Well, I'd say text, but I guess code is more correct? As Will is referred to as female in the trainer data, while also going by he, him pronouns. Though, that variable is only there to decide the gender of a trainer's Pokemon, and we can see this with other trainers like Bugsy and Saturn, two characters who have also had odd bouts about their gender. But then again, characters like Jasmine and Isun also have a different variable, but they don't have any theories surrounding them about their genders. So I kinda doubt this evidence, plus we have seen them as two separate people at the same time in the same location. But that is a gotcha spinoff, so... Eh. I've personally always had this little theory that Will was actually born on the same island in the Sevi Islands as Lorelei. And maybe that made him kind of a huge fan of hers? Like maybe it's a Lance Claire situation, but Will is more respectful to his inspiration. And that's why he keeps her room the same out of respect. Though, that theory is also pretty eh, as there isn't much of evidence to come to that conclusion, especially since he gets his own room in the remakes. And at the end of the day, this is all fan theory, so believe what you want, it's more fun that way. The next member is the returning gym leader, Koga, now promoted into an Elite Four member. Out of all the Kanto gym leaders to get a promotion, Koga probably wouldn't have been my first choice, like he'd definitely be up there, but probably not my first choice. And hell, the beta actually had Giovanni and Misty in his Elite Four, which would have definitely been the more popular choices. But I really like Koga in this new role. It really allows him to branch out his strategies a bit more to become a full-time, stats-afflicting bastard that he's always wanted to be. I'm so proud of him. I just wish he'd stop stall poisoning me. It's kind of a dick move, dude. Just saying. Then, we have the returning Bruno. Yep, same stick as before. Though now he rocks some steel type serpents instead of. Oh, never mind. He keeps the onyx. Why the fuck doesn't he have Steelix in the originals? And then we have Karen, probably the most based out of all Elite Four members. The Dark type master is known for her philosophy behind Pokemon battles. Strong Pokemon, weak Pokemon. That is only the selfish perception of people. Truly skilled trainers should try to win with their favorites. This phrase has been used to torment competitive players for decades. It's honestly a really heartwarming phrase, and I tend to agree with it in most cases. I respect competitive Pokemon for what it is, but I also think it's dreadfully boring, and I have no interest in it at all. Unless it's the memes or the crazy comebacks with lower tier mons and higher tier competitions. Look, whenever I decide to play Showdown, I just always use this dumb ground-type gym team I made for that one video that, let's be honest, nobody watched. I don't blame y'all, by the way. That, sh that layout? That shit was ass. But that team was really fun, and I get immense enjoyment from winning at an obscene disadvantage. Bring back Anything Goes National decks. That shit was so fun. Oh, but Revive Cats and Shedinja! That sounds like a skill issue if you ask me. Shedinja can't do shit if Sandstorm knocks it out, even with Terra Substitute. But enough of the grievances about a highly specific yet extremely fun and cool game mode. Karen is a great character and I really like her. Though her fit was dog ass, that redesign really saved her in Heart Gold and Soul Silver. And she by no means is the only character that game saved. Then we get to Lance, where we see his strategy is 
cheating in underleveled pseudo legends and hyperbeam spam. All right, <laughs> okay. Though, ironically, I kind of find this to be one of the easier champ fights due to his extreme weakness to rock and ice. This game gives you a pseudo wudo. You just put ice punch and rock slide and that bitch will literally shred him to death. Especially if you got a reflect and a light screen user, the battle just plays itself. Even if you're under leveled, though his fight in Heart Gold and Soul Silver is a kind of a bit better strategy wise. In other ways, it's kind of eh. And that's the main game for Gold and Silver, a fairly short but decent adventure. Though it's kind of odd to beat a game while still in the level 30s. Oh shit! Yep, that's right. After beating the main Johto games, we get to have a victory lap in Kanto. Dealing with the Kanto gyms, with them having new designs like Misty, whose new design is extremely underrated. Seriously, look at this and tell me it's not better than the original. I'm calling you a liar. And look what they gave Blaine in Hard Gold and Soul Silver. He's so dapper. You know he makes his way to the club every night to impress all the golden girls with his fire dance moves. Oh, better bring the bird heel, ladies. <laughs> he does this to help forget the pain of his home crumbling into a molten husk. Hey, look, we got a cute Koga Jr. Aww. <laughs> Uh, I'm kidding. I do love Janine though, but seriously, why do you have level 30s, girl? Everyone else is in the 40 to 50 range. You gotta get with the program. Like, they don't even fix this in the remakes. She's still drastically under level. She's legit built like a six gym leader. You take too much from your father, girl. Oh, and look who's took over the eighth gym. Good old rival blue. I like the new digs, man. I also had a phase where I was autistically obsessed with Legos. <laughs> I still am, I just don't have the money or time to build them. And would you look at this? We got ourselves an American Team Rocket member. The Bye Bye A Go Go guy is supposed to be a fanboy of the Rockets who came from overseas. And in black and white, we actually find out he's Unovan. Which leads me to wonder, is his accent supposed to be a southern drawed Watashi Wa type accent? Sumimasen America Karakimashita Bye Bye I'm a Go going what the fuck <laughs> ah this place is great it's nice to see the old stompy grounds all new and fresh hey, except for the casual xenophobic comments about our character being from Chota. i don't know what that's about but it's great to see what they've done with the place the fuck is this <laughs> all right the game boy color had limitations and we all know game freak is the bethesda of monster taming so bugs are expected but to cram two regions into one game Oh boy. They were in desperate need from help from the big N, with Mr. Awada himself coming in and programming the game to be able to fit the two regions. Could you imagine if they brought the big N earlier to do more than just debugging? Like, we talk about the cutting room floor, but my god, all the shit they cut out of this game, it could reach to the ceiling. But hey, 16 gems, two regions? That's pretty cool. Though, an oddity about the game is how badges actually boost their corresponding type power. So, if you had Misty's badge, it would increase your water moves. Or Whitney's badge would increase your normal moves, which is cool. Except, there are 17 types. And 16 gems. Sorry, Dark, but no boost for you. Well, after beating all 16 gems, it's time for us to... <clears throat> it's time for... It's time to Ugh. Time to go up to Mount Silver. Fine, we'll talk about silver and not that silver or that silver or that silver or even that silver. I mean silver, silver. This guy, this fucking guy is so boring. Like really, what is Silver? I'll tell you what he is, everything that Blue wasn't. Where Blue was an interesting character who always had a unique way of taunting the player and even pushing them to be better and stronger, Silver's a piece of work who just does nothing but bitch and moan about the world or the power he doesn't have. 
every bit of his dialogue is just, I'm so strong and cool, you're nothing to me. Oh golly, you better watch your ass. One extremely easy fight later. That doesn't count, I'm so cool, you couldn't do that for real. And it's just like, shut the fuck up, man. 20 hours of this. Why does anyone like him? He just whines and cries about everything. And then he blames you for shit you got no control over. Why do you care about Jasmine taking care of Ampharos? You don't even challenge the gyms. Why do you care? And then, oh my God. Then he has the nerve to constantly put his hands on us and push us around. And I can't stand that shit. You're so lucky this is Pokemon, because if it wasn't, I'd break your hands. Wait a second. We saw Lance hyperbeam a bitch. Why can't we do that to you? But Chubby, he's a troubled kid with abandonment issues. And he learns from his experiences and becomes a better person through empathy and love. <gasps> yeah, well, you're right. You're absolutely right. On paper, Silver is a well-written character. It would be an unfair criticism to say otherwise. Silver's story is one of abandonment that led him to lash out at the world and the Pokemon around him. And it's only through love and empathy from other characters in the game that he changes and grows as a person. He even gets one of the new friendship evolutions with Crobat, and I like that detail a lot. Silver is a good character. There's even a whole Reddit post that has this response that goes through in great detail about it. And yeah, I know I'm stealing another Reddit post again, but it is unfair that I've made myself look up other perspectives while trying to write this section. Cause part of me still just wants to rip this kid a new one. Cause I've never liked this kid, even when I was a kid. And a lot of it had to do with how he hit us and how the game didn't really let me do anything about it. Is that stupid? Yeah, and that's why I'm doing something about it now, by expressing that here. But I'm also just not a huge fan of this character archetype. I, I think it's just really overplayed. And I think that Gold and Silver do it really, really poorly. It literally took to Heart Gold and Soul Silver to find out what Silver's deal was. And nowadays, it's locked behind an event, you know, without cheating. So it's pretty much unaccessible unless you're able to cheat. So it's really not Silver's fault that he's poorly written. And it's kind of not his fault that I don't like him as a character. He, he is a good character. It's unfair of me to say otherwise. Though I really do think he's overhyped. Like everybody talks about the jerk rivals of the old games. I've heard that shit since I was a kid playing Diamond and the older kids talked about how cool the jerks were. But here they are. Yeah, it's just silver. I mean, last time I talked about Blue, but he's really just socially inept, so I don't count him. I mean, it, it really is pretty funny, because when people talk about jerky rivals, I mean, I mean, what are you talking about? It's just silver. Because all the other ones are pretty much in later games. We got Bead, Gladion, sort of Arvin, at least when you first meet him. That is, of course, unless somebody's got a copy of Ruby, Sapphire, and Emerald that had an evil May. That would have been interesting. But nope. Silver's a fine rival. He has a good character arc about overcoming his traumatic past and coming to terms and finding a more kinder, more compassionate way forward. And it is funny that I compare him to Blue earlier. A lot of my opinion surrounding that character comes from a fan theory that's not really all that concrete. Well, or at least a good chunk comes from a fan theory. The rest, I pretty much intuited on my own. But you know, it is kind of funny that the idea that Blue had a connection to the Rockets, because Silver does have a genuine connection to the Rockets. It's just sad to say that connection is practically irrelevant. Man, it would have made for an amazing plot point in the game proper. Though, there was something else about him I wanted to talk about, but I just can't put my finger on it. Eh, it'll come back to me. Something that won't come back though, are all the Pokemon he stole. Seriously, he didn't catch any of them. He just stole from random trainers, and if he didn't, he made fun of their weak Pokemon. What an asshole. Though, if we're being honest, he is a little based from stealing from that guy in Cianwood. Cause I def did that shit too. And also that guy on that one route, but we don't talk about him right now. 
This guy, this fucking guy in CN would. Even his neighbors bitched about how he bragged about his Pokemon all the time. With his shuckle and his sneasel, such rare encounters he was asking for. Just come on, look at him! Also, since these games don't force you to go to Sprout Tower, you can actually skip it and complete it after the Elite Four, and Silver won't be there. That's pretty good attention to detail. But, that all out of the way, it's time to climb Mount Silver. Why is it Mount Silver? Why is it, why is it all just silver in these games? There's nothing gold. Is, is that not weird to anybody else? But anyway, it's time to climb Mount Silver and face off against the most iconic trainer in the series. You, or Red. Because even though this game does have connectability to RGB, they don't carry over your Hall of Fame. That would have made this fight really interesting if Red used your actual team. But this is fine, and I really enjoy this battle and the subtle hints to him in the beginning of the game. It's a hard fought fight against the ultimate Pokemon trainer. But even if you're under leveled, you should be able to manage. I mean, you've already came this far. Though that's not all for you to do as this old man and pewter will give you the other legendary's wing, allowing you to capture Lugia in gold or Ho-Ho in silver. This is actually a really cool bonus for these games, and it truly cements these two as the outsiders of the typical version exclusive legends, as they are, funnily enough, not version exclusive. I think the only other thing to talk about is the trainer house, which is usually just this one guy named Cal with all the Johto starters. But, the trainer actually changes in there depending on the last mystery gift you received. Which you pretty much only get with this girl in Goldenrod and a copy of Stadium 2. The items she gives you being a random assortment of decorations for your room, battle, evolution items, and also a brick that does nothing. But hey, it's pretty cool. Unless you don't have Stadium 2, so instead you just don't have anyone else to fight. Other than Cal. And let's be honest, he's just kind of boring. And that's Gold and Silver, games that were made to be the ultimate Pokemon experience. And if it isn't yours, well, it at least probably set the groundwork for it. In my opinion, these games are good. I really enjoy them a lot. I know, hot take, Gold and Silver are good games, but truly they are. Maybe not my favorite, but with 16 gems, two regions, and the perfect final boss, how can you ask for anything else? Well, I mean, you certainly can. I mean, that's how we got Pokemon Crystal for our Zia's sakes. Though, we'll get there in a minute. For right now, let's just bask in the glory for a minute. That end credits theme. Oh, it's so nice, isn't it? The perfect theme to end a journey with. Oh boy, there really is something I need to talk about in relation to Johto. I'm not sure if now is the time or if it's better served to be the in cap for this video. Hmm. I think later would be better. So if you guys are ready, let's dive right back in the gen 2 with There it is, guys. Think you can unlock the mystery of the unknown? What do you think those strange workings mean? Just help me push. You can enter the world of Pokemon Crystal, the latest adventure from Johto with an all-new Pokedex. This can I hmm? Pokemon Crystal, gotta catch them all. Pokemon Crystal. Developed by Game Freak and the Big N itself as a sort of prototype game to test out the new idea they had. Mobile gaming. Well, kinda. You see, Pokemon Crystal was announced as Space World 2000, under the working title Pokemon X. Alongside a peripheral known as the Mobile Game Boy Adapter, which allowed the handheld to connect to Japanese cell phones, in turn allowing Game Boy games to connect wirelessly to other games using this feature. That's even where Crystal actually gets its name from, the crystals in cell phones that allowed them to connect to each other wirelessly. Alongside this peripheral, there would be a new paid online service called Mobile System GB, whose big claim to fame was its ability to allow trainers in Pokemon Crystal to battle each other wirelessly through its own server as well as sending event items, trainers, and Pokemon to players of Pokemon Crystal, all through the new communication center in Goldenrod. Though all of this wasn't free, however, a certain event items and trainer battles were locked behind a paywall on top of the fee for using the system. 
Of course, this being Nintendo and a neat little peripheral, this service never left the region of Japan. Due to how complicated it would have been to get the service to work with non-Japanese cell phone services, and, you know, in turn, non-Japanese cell phones. With IGN writing in their report on the project, billing and popularity of cell phones are very different in Japan than they are in America, and the Japanese market is designed specifically for devices such as this. It might not be practical for Nintendo to release the device here, and it's questionable whether enough young gamers would even have a cell phone to use it with. The big end keeping it in the home region may have been for the best, as this service was shut down hardly a year after its release due to its failure to really take off, leaving a lot of the exclusive features it brought to Pokemon X, now known as Pokemon Crystal, dead in its wake. Such as the GS Ball, a special event item that allowed the player to capture the mythical Pokemon Celebi. Game Freak tried to implement this item in the cartridge itself for the worldwide release, but that unfortunately didn't work out. Similarly to how the Pokemon anime famously had the GS Ball be a huge plot point, only to drop it hard after an unsatisfying conclusion. Though thankfully this was rectified in the eShop release of Gen 2, except that it's not now, cause now they're unavailable. Eh, at least they tried. Now, with this in mind, you'd think that Mystery Gifts as a whole would be scrapped as a concept due to their either boring implementation or the fact that their limited time status kept future and returning players from experiencing them. But no, fuck you, it's gone and they'll keep doing this all the way to present day where it's a necessary requirement for plot lines. Oh boy, I hate this stuff. But we've been there, done that. What about the rest of the game? Well, Crystal actually introduces a lot of mainstay features that'll stick around for the rest of the series, such as the ability to choose the player's gender between male and female. How progressive for 2000, but then again, this is credited for being a huge step forward for having more gender options in games, so yeah, it actually was. We also have a new post-game battle facility in the Battle Tower. It's quite lackluster from its later incarnations, but it is great if you get tired of rebattling Cal once a day. And lucky us outsiders, we are able to challenge the tower whenever we want, unlike the Japanese release that had it tied to the phone stuff, making it unaccessible after the service went offline. Oh, they didn't think that shit through at all, did they? Some new gameplay changes were added around the region, including wild Pokemon spawns, such as how Blue and Yellow reworked their original games. Though in Crystal's case, this was done to make some rarer mods more available, and also have some better type distribution around in the early game. Also, if you have a Game Boy printer, you're able to print out stickers of your Pokemon, which is pretty neat. And you could also do something like that in Gold and Silver and Yellow, so uh, please forgive me for not mentioning that before. There are some miscellaneous changes, such as how you go about getting certain items, and a new gift Pokemon in the Odd Egg, and we got animated intro sprites, that's kinda cool. But otherwise, Crystal, like Yellow and Blue before, it is essentially a director's cut or deluxe version of the originals. Though that Suicune on the cover isn't just for show, as we actually got some plot changes which now surround the Water Beast. Yeah, I say beasts. There's always a discussion about whether these things are cats or dogs, similar to what's going on with the evolutions, but officially they're known as beasts, which I think works better as a descriptor as they take multiple traits from a variety of animals, such as prehistoric mammals, the bigger cats, large canines. But anyway, in this version of the story, the main character, in our case, Crystal, though you may refer to her as Chris, is forced to head into the Twin Tower. Whoa! Okay, that's an unfortunate slip of the tongue. Though not entirely inaccurate. Strange that these came out in 2001, huh? Weird. Play that little weird X-Files. <laughs> Theme, you know what I'm talking about? Fuck, I wonder what I'm talking about. Well, anyway, she heads into the burned tower due to Morty investigating the site with a friend of his named Isun, an important character for this new storyline. Also, Silver is here to bitch about us being susceptible to gravity. Always a pleasure! Splish. Well, after coming to, Crystal is face to face with the beasts, with them running away, except for Suicune, who takes a second to size us up 
before then following suit. With the soon coming in and basically acting like Kieran, but for the older gens. He's a man who's straight up obsessed with the beast of water and mist so much that he changed his name to be an anagram of Suicune, but it still chose me. And he's like, what do you have that I don't? And you know what? I agree. What do I have that he soon doesn't? Like me and Suicune locked eyes once and now she's obsessed with me? Hanging around the different nooks and crannies of the Johto region with her best makeup on, hoping I catch a glimpse and speak to her. I know he's a simp, Suicune, but at least he soon actually wants you. Though, maybe you're interested due to Crystal being the one to defeat Team Rocket. You know, the people who could have used actual development as characters instead of Mystery Man over here? Also, if you want to catch Ho-Ho and Crystal, you have to catch all the three beasts first which isn't too bad with Suicune being a static encounter, but the other two are still roaming, so uh, good luck. Thankfully, my man Lugia is always there when I need him. Or is Lugia supposed to be female? I, I don't remember that interview too well. But speaking of strange stuff, the ruins of Alf now have a strange message in them if you solve all the puzzles leading to the reveal of what may have happened to its ancient creators. Neat. Doesn't have anything to do with Suicune, like the intro would suggest, but okay, cool. I guess the only other story thing going on is the new Claire stuff where we have to take the quiz instead of finding the Fang. Though this did allow me to meet the heads of their little clan, where they tell me that you need to pass the test in order to use dragons. Shh, I'm pretty sure you don't. And I know that for sure because for some reason Claire, you know, the big gym leader of your clan, she gets to use them, and she's failed the test multiple times. I really don't know how, since it's pretty much unfailable, but she found a way, which means this place is filled with gatekeeping and favoritism for a certain family. This is, the, the Dragon Clan is just a cult, all right? I, I can't remember if there's anything more to do with them when we get to like Iris in black and white, but like until then, for what we know right now, put a stamp on it, Cult. Certified cult. And that's Pokemon Crystal! Yay! <laughs> it adds a lot to base gold and silver while also distributing the Pokemon around a lot more to give us a wider variety to use. I think this is one of the cases where the Deluxe Edition is probably the best overall experience for a generation, which is a lot better than what happened with Gen 1. If you're curious about heading into Gen 2 Johto, which I do highly recommend, I think this is the best way to go. Though, if you're wondering what the best Johto experience overall is... Ah, come on, you already know what's coming. I play Pokemon Heart Gold version. I play Pokemon Soul Silver version. I collect Pokemon, trade them, and engage in heated battle. Mostly he loses, like now. And when I'm not playing, I have my Pokewalker on me. I use mine to find items I can use in the game. I can also catch Pokemon and connect with friends or my brother. I use mine when I run to earn lots. I just took 5,000 steps. What about you? Hey, me too. Pokemon Heart Gold and Pokemon Soul Silver version games with the Pokewalker accessory only for Nintendo DS systems. Rated E for everyone. Pokemon Heart Gold and Soul Silver. Oh boy! Releasing in Japan in 2009 and 2010 everywhere else, I remember this time well because it was actually around my birthday and I got to experience it while watching my favorite YouTuber at the time playing through the original Crystal. Ah, memories. Either way though, development surrounding Heart Gold and Soul Silver is pretty interesting. You see, now endowed with the knowledge of how a remake can work alongside of or how it can relate to the main games of a generation, Game Freak were able to go into this with a brand new perspective on how to do it. You see, Johto didn't necessarily need a remake, or at least not for the same reason as Kanto did in Gen 3. A majority of the decks was already obtainable in Gen 4 with the release of Pokemon Platinum, and many stragglers could have been easily transferred up from the Generation 3 games. No, no, there was no real need to remake Johto. But they really wanted to, and the heart behind this project was a man known as Takao Uno though by no means was he the sole piece of this game's passion. All of Game Freak was down the clown to make this game the best they could, 
I just bring Uno up because of how thematically interesting he is in comparison to the development surrounding this game. You see, Game Freak wanted to make the ultimate Pokemon experience. They were never fully satisfied by gold, silver, and crystal, with Tajiri going as far to say that he felt that the perfect game was right around the corner when asked about gold, silver, and crystal, and he thought that the kids playing those games now would probably become developers later, and they would probably be the ones to expand the Pokemon world by working at Game Freak later. And Apollo must have been gifting his prophecy that day, because these games are what led a young Takao Uno to become a video game artist, and guess where he worked? That's right, 10 years later, he worked at Game Freak and got to work on the art for Heart Gold and Soul Silver. Don't you just like when shit lines up like that? It's really satisfying, isn't it? Unlike Fire Red and Leaf Green, which only took about one year of development, Heart Gold and Soul Silver actually took around three, as Game Freak really aimed to really remake the experience of the spirit of the old games while also being something brand new, which apparently made the whole process a very rewarding challenge for them. When asked about the differences between the originals and the remakes, director Morimoto said, With Heart Gold and Soul Silver, the way in which trainers and Pokemon relate has become a major theme, and this has been added to the story. We came up with the titles Heart Gold and Soul Silver, as we decided these would be appropriate to express this theme. And that very theme came to light with the new game mechanics added for this game, including the ability to walk with every one of your Pokemon in the overworld. This was a feature way back in yellow with the starter Pikachu, and the Sinnoh games with certain Pokemon in Amity Square. But here and now it's every Pokemon, and each and every one of them can draw from a pool of reactions to all of the happenings of the outside world and the players themselves, making them feel like they're actually living, breathing partners in our adventure. To say that this is one of the best features they've ever come up with is a giant understatement. After these games, it is practically the most requested feature of any game that comes out without it. Pokemon is all about the bonds between the player and the monsters. This feature brings that to the forefront better than any other attempt that tries to replace or supplement it. And it doesn't stop there. You can take your Pokemon on the go alongside you with this new peripheral, the Pokewalker. A small pedometer that allows you to transfer a Pokemon from the games to this cute little Pokeball to walk around with to gain experience, collect items, battle, and capture exclusive wild Pokemon. The idea from this actually came from a few places, including the Pocket Pikachu, a small device released during the in-betweens of Gen 1 and 2 that was able to let you walk around with a little Pikachu all Tamagotchi style. And it actually had a sequel that went on to be compatible with Gold and Silver. You remember that mystery gift stuff I mentioned before? Yeah, you could use this for that too. Though, again, kind of odd that the mystery gift is tied to all this stuff you probably don't have. But hey, it's cool! And between that and a story about Ishihara dropping a DS pedometer in a puddle, and then becoming in awe as it still worked when he found it a month later in that same puddle, which all led to the Pokewalker's development. Which, by the way, this thing isn't just a fun little peripheral. It was actually awarded the most accurate pedometer for its time by an Iowa State professor, which is rad as fuck. But the cherry on top of all of this, you get to take pictures with your Pokemon and have an album chronicling your whole adventure. Why is this not a main feature? I mean, it's kind of an X and Y, sorta. But like, it's not like this. This is so cool. I love it so much. The game also featured all the additions added from Gen 3 and Gen 4, including abilities, sexual dimorphism, Pokeball seals, though you need to feed this fat ass cow a bunch of berries to get them. But that's not that bad because you have a personal portable berry farm in your pocket and you won't believe this, but online play without a cell phone. It's even got a Battle Tower successor and the Battle Frontier, which was brought over from Pokemon Platinum. 
alongside an expanded roster of Pokemon, including ones that the originals didn't have without transferring from red through yellow, Heart Gold and Soul Silver have been widely considered the most content-packed Pokemon game ever created. And we haven't even discussed the rest of the stuff it came up with, such as the Poke Athlon, basically the Pokemon Olympics that features the twin brother of Primo from Fire Red and Leaf Green, who's also back and he actually gives you some neat knickknacks in the Violet City Pokemon Center, which is pretty cool. And this Wolfric looking dude who's uh, kind of just here. I mean, he is the head of the place, and when you get the National Dex, you're able to enter the Supreme Cups, where you're able to go up against him, the Johto Gym Leaders, and other characters such as Maylene, who's visiting from Sinnoh, alongside the main man himself, Crasher Wake! Though he's just, uh, sightseeing at the mall. The Pokeathlon is actually a really fun side mode with all the different events, which is just kind of makes my hand hurt, but otherwise they are really fun. And your Pokemon even have stats that are exclusive to this mode, making it kind of like contests in a sense. It's really too bad this mode just never came back, it really is a lot of fun. It can even be played with your friends through multiplayer. Though be prepared for some tough opponents, even the likes of the gods can't handle a Togepi in its prime, Jesus. The game also adds in two new routes with their own, uh, let's just say, interesting characters? but they also add a Safari Zone. Yeah, okay, this one's kinda cool. Basically, Balboa, the Warden, packed up from Kanto so that the original Safari Zone could be turned into the Pal Park, a transfer station for Gen 3 to Gen 4 games. So after doing that, he came to Johto and made the most extravagant and impressive Safari Zone ever with enough customization to make it so any number of a wide variety of Pokemon can appear. You see, the zones can actually switch out for other zones, and then these special items can be placed along the different land masses to attract non-Kanto Johto Pokemon. But he had a problem. This whole thing is a giant humanitarian and Poketarian crisis. Not only does literally moving each land module uproot all the Pokemon that make that place their home, but he literally forces people to move the land with their own two hands. So, he comes up with a scam. I mean, brilliant idea to pass on the ownership of the zone to the player. Except, we don't actually own anything, and we even still have to pay to use it, so really, we're just a scapegoat, which is so just hilarious, it fucked up, it'd probably work. But this version of the zone does allow us to find a wide variety of Pokemon, including letting us catch Pokemon like Larvitar, Mistrevis, and Houndour before post-game. Why wasn't that just fixed in the rounds? It's y'all's third time at bat, and this is still a problem. But it's a problem with a band-aid solution. And we can catch new Pokemon here, which is cool. Except Balboa is slower than molasses to get anything done. For one thing, to actually gain ownership, uh, in quotation marks by the way, of the zone and use all the cool features, you need to pass two tests, which are to catch a Geodude and a Sandshrew. Simple, right? Wrong, because it takes his old ass six in-game hours to come up with these tests. So we don't even get to use the zones to their fullest extent till the near end game. But at least in post game, he comes up with the item system to catch other regional Pokemon, which is cool, right? Only problem with that is it takes him even longer for him to randomly call you and give you a random set of items, which you need to pray are the ones that you need to make a Pokemon you want spawn. So get ready to spend hours waiting for all that, but also get ready to wait months as the Pokemon take their sweet time getting there. Oh, I'm not waiting eight months for a Bronzong. Some of these guys take years. It takes years to get a bag. You could play all of Ruby to get you a bag off. What the fuck? Why would you ever make it work like this? 
You psychopaths. Oh. Shadow Safari Zone. Cool on paper? Shit tier in execution. Go join the club. But also thank you for the early alarm retard. The gym leaders actually have a lot more interactions with the overworld, which is pretty cool. At least for, for some of them. Others, we just got shit like Faulkner and Janine really fumbling their date night by having a dick measuring contest between their fathers. Phrasing. But others are pretty cool to talk with and will even be available for rematches at the old Saffron Dojo. They also now give you TMs when you beat them and Blaine gets a new gym, which is super cool. But Janine is still far too weak, and the gyms don't have full teams, which just kind of eh. But the rematch teams they use are really cool, and some of them will offer to trade Pokemon with you, which is also really cool. Though this is actually kind of funny, as Jasmine tries to give you a Steelix named Rusty, which if you play Diamond, Pearl, and Platinum, you know that she used that Steelix in contests. And since Heart Gold and Soul Silver and Diamond and Pearl take place at the same time, that means she lost in those contests in Sinnoh and is now trying to give her Steelix away in disgust, which is brutal. She'll literally take any Pokemon for it. But to be honest, I kind of get it. After these rejects lost the Pokeathlon, so you know what? Fair trade in my book. Failure for failure. Just make sure you watch out for Daisy Oak though. The only way to get her brother's number is to have tea with her from 3 p.m. to 4 p.m. sharp for a week straight. And Daisy doesn't fuck around about tea time either. If you come too early or you're too late, you ain't getting her brother's digits. This is her tea time and nobody messes with her tea time. She is the granddaughter of Professor Oak, older sister to ex-champion Blue, and a well-awarded contest coordinator in her own right. The world may be your oyster, but Pallet Town is her kingdom, and we will all bow to her busy schedule. Jesus! Blue's rematch is pretty cool, though, as it calls back to his Fire Red Leaf Green rematch, but damn, woman, really?! You at least have more than chamomile. Like really, you don't have like any southern sweet tea in this bitch? Come on. The Elite Four also get some really strong rematch teams, as any set of trainers are if a Garchomp is anywhere near the vicinity. But I kind of miss the mixed types used by Koga and Karen. Though again, Karen's new fit is immaculate, and Toxicroak, Skunk Tank, and Swalot on Koga? goes unbelievably hard. But I'm kinda sad about Red's new team. Not the level 80s, that's fine, and from a canonical standpoint, eh, that may be my karma coming back to bite me, but he traded in his Espeon for a Lapras, which is so boring. I mean, yeah, they're both gift Pokemon in the originals, so I mean, in that regard, they work. But the Espeon had so much more storytelling to it, as it was one of the few Pokemon available to him that had a Johto evolution. And I think that works really well as it shows how he continued to grow as a trainer after we left him in Gen 1. He wasn't just wasting time away on a mountain, he kept training, kept adventuring, kept growing. And I like to think that all of these protagonists do that when our time with them is done. Espeon represents that, and if you ever have the time, go look at his teams in Stadium 2. I love the variety. Though, speaking of variety, and this may make my point a bit mute, or moot, whichever word, but how cool would it have been for him to use your Hall of Fame team from Fire Red and Leaf Green? Or at least let Leaf be an optional fight on Mount Silver if you beat Leaf Green or Fire Red as a girl. That would have been really cool. Oh, speaking of the phone, it doesn't really stop you where you are anymore. As long as it's not story important, you can just ignore it. Or at least try, that ringing can be a major annoyance. But these could be rematches or free items, so, you know, talk to your mom once in a while. Don't be an asshole like Red over here. Though, maybe she could ease up on spending my money for shit she clearly doesn't want or need. Hold on. 
Is this an excuse to give the player gifts? To my knowledge, the stuff she buys doesn't actually come out of your bank account. Oh my god, is this her way of thanking us for trusting her to act as our personal bank? Is trainers leaving their parents behind such an issue? Our mom made up a bank system to keep us around? Oh, that's so fucking sad. The visuals of this game are wonderful. It's a step up from the style of Gen 4 with a mix of 3D models and 2D sprites, which can look a bit jarring in one or two places, but otherwise is seamless. And the color palette is so bright and colorful. The Generation 4 style is really quite good if you ask me, though I won't lie, there might be a little bias in me saying that, but I don't know, I feel like the pixel art and the models in these games really hold up, and that's almost two decades later. And when we get to Gen 5, oh boy, it's pretty much that sentiment, but doubled. The DS era just looks so good. And the redesigns for the gym leaders, I already mentioned Blaine and Karen before, but look at everyone else, they're so stylish, including all of their new gym layouts. Oh yeah. Even the main characters got a redesign. Well, you know, sort of technically. This isn't Chris, as they kind of forgot she existed till after Lyra here was already made. But it is funny that they kept the twin ponytail thing. And the next part, it's a tad superfluous, you know? But the constant run button on the bottom screen, alongside the key items and just an A button? It's just a real quality of life thing. I just wish they did more, y you know? Just streamline the little stuff. I mean, I guess they've done that in modern games with full 360 movement and the, you know, the complete lack of key items. But still, they got rid of this for a while, which is dumb. But this is so cool. The music is probably some of the most impressive work. And I don't just mean the songs, those are all wonderful remixes. But can I also just like talk about their D mixes? The GB sound is a gadget you get in the post game that turns the music back to match the Game Boy Color original. Which is already impressive since those songs tend not to work very well on a sound font that wasn't the colors but the team went out of their way to make Gen 2 styled songs for the new areas, including the Safari Zone and the Battle Frontier. And that's not all, as this was the first game to include environmental sounds to the different areas. In Heart Gold and Soul Silver, if you stand beside running water or you're in a windy area, with, you know, like when you're high up on a tower or mountain or something, you hear it. That is such a wonderful level of detail that they didn't need to add, especially since this is a DS game, but I'm so glad they did. This is beautiful. Story-wise, it's about the same as the original games, but with Isun and Suicune stuff added in. I have no strong feelings one way or another on them, because they do also flesh out the rockets in this remake, they gave them names, otherwise they're still kind of boring. I like the purple one, but these two are just the budget Jesse and James. And Proton... I, it, I don't know about fucking Proton, man! Do you even know- did you know his name before I said it? You, come on! But, at least we got to put on a disguise and we got to try to infiltrate the tower takeover. I actually really like this idea as it saves us from doing all the typical bad guy battle gauntlet shit. And these guys are already dreadfully boring so I'm kind of down for this. Oh hey look, Silver's here. Nice to see him try to fight the rockets after the originals just had him bitch and moan about them without ever actually lifting a finger to stop them. But hey, now it's time to make things right. Go get him, buddy! Hey, hey, wait, no, stop, wait, no, what the fu- No, no, this was so cool and fu- What are you do Oh, god damn it! Ah, uh, I see you were trying to infiltrate their ranks to save a bunch of innocent people in Pokemon. How weak and pathetic. 
Okay, see you later. Bye. <laughs> this. This was the moment. I hated Silver for the rest of my childhood. You took away the most interesting gameplay idea this region has had for the rockets, and then were forced to do the rocket tower as normal, which is already just mid. It's just mid. Like, in the literal sense of the word, this is middling. How cool would it have been for the player to have a stealth section? Why even include the disguise at all? Do they want us to hate him even more? And he doesn't even help out after. He just fucks off so he can bother us again in a minute. Why does anyone like you? Which brings me to my biggest problem with this remake and how it tries to force gold and silver to work like mainline games. Sure, we can go over how this game forces tutorials now while the original left them to be completely optional, which was rad as fuck by the way, but that's little stuff, that's nothing. What really bugs me is what they do with Lugia and Ho-Oh. So, while exploring the games we get these moments where we meet the Kimono Girls. Minor characters in the original who's part of the side quest to get surf. It was fun and there was a surfing ride on which was based. But now they're just hanging around the region, secretly testing the player to see if they're worthy. Which is exactly what Suicune is doing at the same time, but for completely different reasons, so I don't know what ifs. But they want to see if we're worthy of battling either Ho-Oh or Lugia. Which in a way, doesn't sound too bad, but I promise it does. For one, now we can't do the legend after Rocket Tower. If we try, we're booted out by these dipshits who say we need more than the mythical feather to get in and battle them. We now need two items, the feather and a new bell item. And you know you only need the two items for one of them. In the post game, it's right back to the one wing, but fuck it, whatever. How do I get the bell? Well, you get the bell after you defeat Claire, as Professor Elm will tell you about the kimono girls wanting to see you. <sighs> okay. That's fine. I guess moving the timeline of when I get to catch the legend is not a bad idea. But what isn't fine is that I'm forced to do it. Lugia and Ho-Oh are a fun side venture in the originals, but now you have to stop everything you're doing to go fight them. Why? These two have jack shit to do with anything going on in the plot. Why force me to go after them? I have a problem with this, cause one, it makes everything that was special about these two particularly moot now, as it's just now the stock standard legend fight that's in every game, which I'm gonna be honest, is kinda boring sometimes. And two, if you're gonna make us fight them, why not include it into the main plot? The rocket stuff was already dreadfully dull. Why not make the rocket tower stuff be about them trying to go after the legendary instead? Like, for real, they were just ignoring their existence in Gen 2. So if you want things to be more akin to other games, why not make the villain stuff mix with the legend stuff? Maybe this could have been what Isun and Suicune were also doing. Like, maybe Suicune's interested in you, because it believed you to be the one to stop the rocket's goal of controlling either Ho-Oh or Lugia. And that would be why Suicune is intent on following you around. And maybe it even uses the Kimono Girls to help test our resolve. It's really weird that these two just have like nothing to do with each other while also being in the same town and being all about legendary shit. And then Isun can come to terms with why he wasn't chosen and instead resigns himself to become a hero in his own right. And maybe he disregards his simp nature to help us save the region. And it would still make sense as to why you'd have the final battle in the radio tower, as it was once a religious monument to the legendaries, which is why the director had the wing. Imagine a final battle with Archer with either Ho-Oh or Lugia taking us on. The player, along with Isun and Suiku, now had to save the region together. And I think this could have been good for Silver too. Imagine if him trying to stop us from infiltrating the rockets actually had consequences, and him holding us up gave Archer enough time 
Archer is this guy's name, by the way, if you're unaware, gave Archer enough time to control the legendary, and now Silver has a very big example about how his outbursts affect the world around him, and not just his Pokemon, which may be just the break he needs to grow as a person. Because I don't think everyone beating the shit out of him a hundred times is good enough to really challenge him as a person. He needs to see what his own weakness can cause, and after that, we either go to the Whirl Islands or Bell Tower to do an even bigger final battle. This time, Silver along with us and Isun. And hey, maybe all this rocket commotion will bring a certain character out of hiding. Which brings me to another thing the story does really, really poorly. Silver's father, Giovanni. Because one, it's an event only mission and that's just unacceptable as a plot important piece of information. This whole thing gives a lot of context to Silver's character and it's missable DLC, that's stupid. But it's also stupid with its characterization of Giovanni as we find out that in canon during the rocket takeover, he was in a cave about to return to the rockets but due to Celebi timeline bullshit, we were there to stop him, meaning we beat the shit out of him and Archer at the same time. Which is funny, because you can hear Archer's little can I get a motherfucker to, uh... while we fight Giovanni, which is great. I love that he's the one doing the stupid radio call. That's so funny. But what isn't is his characterization, as we find out his entire motivation was to try to rebuild Team Rocket again. And Silver correctly tells him off about how that weak shit won't work, which led him to lose faith in his father and become the shit lord he is. Which makes sense. Except for the fact that in all the Kanto games, Giovanni leaves that rocket shit behind to train the right way. The fuck is this wanting to rebuild Team Rocket shit? I never got to play this event till this video, and I was so disappointed. I always thought this DLC was him being disappointed in the remains of the rockets before battling the player to test their resolve to stop them, which I thought was thoughtful and a wise depiction of the character, only to see it's the exact opposite, and that's super lame. <sighs> so, how bad instead of just being DLC where he may or may not commit suicide, I don't know what that was even about, but what if instead of all that, he just comes in and dresses down Archer personally before having a heart to heart with Silver? You know, actually giving the two characters a genuine and in-game connection to one another? I don't know, maybe I'm crazy, but if you're gonna go through all the trouble to make this more akin to the other games, but maybe you should put in the effort to write it that way. You know, that would have been appreciated. Like really, you could remove Archer and his goons from Gold and Silver, and the only thing that would affect is Silver. And for 90% of the players, they wouldn't even know why, so eh. And then we got the new rival in the game. It's basically just whichever gender you didn't choose, and my god, they're just so nothing burger. Like really, I can't say I hate them because there's nothing to hate. Their only relevance to the plot and the game itself is to show off following Pokemon at the beginning of the game. And to do this whole gold leaf feature, which I'm pretty sure does nothing and nobody other than me and Bulbapedia and Cerebi even even like know about it. So, okay. You spent so much time making this guy when you could have gave any of that to actual important characters. I, it's, I know it's odd to get on a remake, you know, for this, since I let the originals get off scot-free, you know, but if you're taking the time to redo stuff, it makes no sense to me why you would perfect everything else but make the story of the game worse. Why is the cool optional shit, like the Sprout Tower and the Legendaries, mandatory? It was much more interesting when it was on our own, you know, to explore the region, and that led us to find all those cool bonuses. I'm on an adventure, not a guided tour. Also, side tangent. They replaced the Rhydon with a Psyduck. You cowards! Like, it doesn't even dance like the Rhydon did! The level scaling's worse. 
it's just worse. I'm, I mean, really, you take the time to fix things like price, but you still keep him under leveled to Jasmine, and all the routes and rocket stuff surrounding him is still in the 20s. They added more trainers and more routes to the game, and this issue is still here. Why did you not think to fix the worst problem with the originals? Why are there trainers with level 20s after the 8th gym? Why? And then when you get to Kanto, where it's a lot better, thankfully, but now you're too underleveled when you first get there. And if you try to use any of the new Pokemon now available in Kanto, guess what? You now had to train them up to level 50 from like level 12. In some cases, they are at a usable level, but it's only like in the Safari Zone or the new legendary encounter, well, some of the new legendary encounters. Everyone else, you're just shit out of luck. And I can't stand that this is an issue on your third attempt at a game. Thankfully, Heart Gold and Soul Silver did make up for Fire Red and Leaf Green, and let's go with cross gen evolutions now being available before post game. You gotta give credit where it's due. That is a really nice change. I like that a lot. And the game did add back all the areas cut from Kanto, including some new areas and events for some Pokemon, which is just really cool. Speaking of events, we actually got quite a few to cover. See, this was the era of online connection, and between that and the usual store promotions, events were as simple as sending out a signal. These included stuff like new routes for the Pokewalker, different legendaries and new items to get you extra legendaries, Pokemon with unusual movesets, and even some events that would tie in into the then unannounced Generation 5. But the two biggest are pretty well known with them both having something to do with the legendary Pokemon Arceus, the Poke God. Though I guess it feels like we get another one of these just every other generation, but this one had some staying power, at least enough to get his own game and be recognized as the genesis of all Pokemon and the world itself. So of course he got his own movie and with that movie we got some events. The first was an event for a special Pichu. You see, if a player was to come to the Elix Shrine with a promotional shiny Pichu, this spiky-eared one would reveal itself and join the player's party. It couldn't evolve, nor could it be transferred to any other game due to timeline shenanigans. Please ignore the other two time-traveling event Pokemon you can get that apparently just don't have any time shenanigans to do with them. But this Pichu is really cute. It's just too bad it's pretty much trapped within a 15-year-old game. Ah well. Though, thanks to Smash Ultimate, we can at least get to see him in HD, so that's cool. But the other is Arceus himself, and this one is quite interesting. You see, the unknown are also known as the arms of Arceus, due to the strange connection the two seem to share. If you bring an event Arceus to the ruins of Alf, it'll transport you to the Sinjo ruins, a set of unusual ruins with a mix of Sinnoh and Johto architecture. It's actually a really interesting location lore-wise, and it gets even more interesting when the champion Cynthia of Sinnoh shows up to give us some more details about the place. Love that they're utilizing her skill as an archaeologist for once. You see, this place actually lies between the two regions, and was built by the two cultures from Mount Cornet and the ruins of Alf. The two places where Arceus and Unknown are most known for. They had apparently mixed their cultures together to have their own sort of like culture in of itself, but things then fell to, well, ruin and it makes you wonder what happened, especially when we have places like the Salation Ruins and the Sevi Island Ruins. I wonder if this culture had anything to do with those. Though we'll probably never know, because if Legends Arceus didn't take the time to tell us about it, I really don't think any game really will. Kind of a missed opportunity if you ask me. But after we get to the place, a jarring sequence of real life locations is shown to the player, and you're able to have Arceus birth a new Sinnoh legend. With the player able to choose which of the three creation trio they like, and they get it at level one. Aw, how cute, a baby god. Oh, 
So we can have two Dialgas running around in canon, but if I so much as move this rat to another state, then we got a paradox going on? What the fuck's all that about? No, I'm not talking about you, Paldia. Stupid, sexy iron thorns. But both of these events are pretty cool. Though, I'm kind of mixed on this next one. If you bring Celebi to the Elix Shrine, it will bring you and Lyra back to the past, sorry Meryl, where you get to see the events of Silver's life that made him this way. And honestly, thank you. Sucks that this is an event only dealio, but I am glad to see Silver's character get some much needed fleshing out. And if I can give Heart Gold and Soul Silver anything, you know, other than it being close to a perfect game, I can give it that it really took the time to help Silver become a much stronger character with more optional appearances and even a double battle. I just wish she got a stronger team though. I mean, I get not having the Magna Zone, it's, you know, it's impossible to evolve outside of Sinnoh and Gen 4, but at least give him a Wii Vial. It's too bad Giovanni's character takes a hit, but we've discussed that already. But hey, fun fact. Did you know that the Elix Shrine actually had nothing to do with Celebi back in the original Gold and Silver? It wasn't until Crystal where it got its connection to it. And that's only because somebody asked Game Freak why there was nothing to do with it and they said, Oh, uh, I don't know. And they just gave it to Celebi. Ah, it's just kind of funny. You'd think that would be obvious, but no. Game development's fun. There's always fun little stories like that. Wait, I just realized something. Gold has Ethan, Chris has Lyra. Why doesn't Silver have a normal name? Like, why is he named after like a traitorous pirate in a 1960s children's book? You, actually, never mind. I can totally believe Giovanni would name his kids something like Silver the Edgehog. <laughs> God, this poor fucker never had a chance. All in all, Heart Gold and Soul Silver are probably the perfect Pokemon game. And if they're not, they're damn close. The gameplay is fun, at least for the most part. The graphics are beautiful, the music and audio effects are so impressive, and the amount of stuff you can do is insane. I can complain about having to wait a year to get a gibble, but at the very least, Hard Gold and Soul Silver would keep me entertained while I waited. There is a reason why these are considered the best Pokemon game. Sure, I, like I said, there are some negatives, but the package overall is so good, I could never let them bring it down. Remaking a game is thought to be, you know, truly impossible, as to recreate something so far removed from the environment it was made in, well, shit, you got your work cut out for you. And to make it similar enough to the original, or at least to the spirit of the original, well, that's just a plain unenviable position. Which makes it all the more impressive that they didn't just nail it with this game, they made the new standard. And for Game Freak, that was a problem. In fact, that may be the biggest regret they have about Heart Gold and Soul Silver. They just can't seem to reach that high again. They try, of course. I mean, Black and White at one point was going to carry over a lot more from Heart Gold and Soul Silver, at least more than the final game we know. But that amount of polish and content and love in Heart Gold and Soul Silver, in their eyes, it's just too much for another game to be developed like it. At least, not with the timetable they're usually given. I really wish I could find this one quote. It was made by a high-ranking employee at Game Freak, but it basically described his regret and how much they put into Heart Gold and Soul Silver because of how difficult it would be to meet that expectation again. Like I said, I can't envy them. And we know how artificial those timetables usually are. And developing stuff on modern consoles is a lot more difficult than it is on the DS. I definitely understand where they're coming from. And I think there really is a big reason as to why games after Heart Gold and Soul Silver felt so stagnant after a while. But that may be a discussion best saved for later. For now, how about we finish that thought I said I'd get back to, like, an hour ago. Johto is such a wonderful region. At least on paper, the architecture and the lore is extremely interesting. The characters are wonderfully designed. The music and the sound design is immaculate. The amount of things to do, whether it be the GBC originals or the remakes, 
Oh, it puts all the other games to shame. But as a region, I don't think Johto has its own identity. Now, this may be a hot take, I know, but think about it. Most of the new Pokemon are only found in Kanto, and a lot of them are just new forms for Kanto Pokemon. The Johto Gym Leaders hardly ever use any of the new Pokemon at all. Most of the final challenge of the region are mostly returning characters from Kanto. Professor Oak is who you see at the beginning instead of Elm. And hell, you spend half the game in Kanto. The Johto stuff is great. But if we're being honest, without Kanto, Johto really isn't enough of its own region. The very idea of the place was to be in contrast to Kanto. It's crazy how much of it relies on that region, which I think makes it feel a bit lacking. I mean, we got like, what, two remakes of Kanto without anything to do with Johto in them. But if Johto got that same treatment and had nothing to do with Kanto, then I know a lot of people who straight up wouldn't even play the game. I know a lot of people who just play through Johto to get to the Kanto stuff, and I don't even know if I blame them. It's not like Johto's a bad time, but without that killer post game, would it even be half as popular? I mean, at least in some sense, again, it does have its own identity, but as a game, as a region of Pokemon, I think it's a bit reliant on Kanto. I can see why they didn't want to bring the whole visiting other regions thing back till Scarlet and Violet's DLC. It kind of takes away from the one you're in, at least in some sense. Now, this isn't Johto's fault, necessarily. Obviously, this comes down to the development of the game. In the early beta, they thought this was going to be it for the franchise. So, they wanted to make it one big celebratory game, with all the old stuff and plenty of new stuff to end the series on a good note. Obviously, that's not what happened, and I bet that's why they shifted gears in development to change the original region of Nippon into Johto, as originally it was an international Japanese adventure, but when they got the money to continue the series, they didn't want to just blow their load on the whole country here. Johto is a victim of factors completely out of its control, and I feel like as a region, it suffers for it. Like in the betas, there were all these deserts and volcanoes and all kinds of wild locations. But the Johto we got, for the most part, just sticks to this tempered climate that Kanto had. So it kind of has the same feeling as Kanto. I can see why, when they got to Hoenn, they did a lot to differentiate itself and try to make it its own region, going as far as to base it on a tropical island off the coast of mainland Japan. And they filled it with deserts, jungles, volcanoes. They really wanted it to do something entirely new and make it a region that could stand on its own. Which is something I'm not entirely convinced Johto can do. Maybe if it was a Legends game, I could kind of see it. But if Johto got a new modern game without Kanto? No, I don't think so. If this is your favorite region, I'm not trying to call you out or nothing, I really do get the appeal. My problem, if we're being honest, is kind of a bit exaggerated. But at the same time, I don't know too many people who would just stop at the Johto Elite Four, you know? That doesn't really feel like an ending. But, you know, this is just one man's opinion. Let's not take it too seriously. I do still love these games, after all. Alright. <clears throat> Lights, please. I believe the Johto games fit just right at these positions. Gold and Crystal are about the same game to me, so they share a ranking. And Heart Gold and Soul Silver, for reasons mentioned before, are some of the best games in the franchise, so around the top sounds about right to me. Like I said, I don't really like Silver, but he's not a bad character. So here is about as low as I can go. I don't hate the guy, but he is not going any higher up for me. The teams for this retrospective were really fun to use. Starting off with the gold, we got a team that stuck with a flower theme name scheme. And that's got a lot to do with Daisy here. Like mentioned earlier in the video, I once used a Cyndaquil for a whole playthrough till about like red, and that Cyndaquil was named Daisy, and she specialized in Solar Beam. 
I've always imagined her having sort of like a bandana that covers up her fiery quills due to her like love of flowers or something, and that playthrough has inspired a passion for the little thing for me, to the point that I recreate this playthrough all the time in other Pokemon games, most recently in Pokemon Violet. In this playthrough, however, we went through the whole evolutionary line, and this Typhlosion was a beast. As long as she was on the field, my battles were essentially won. Daisy the Typhlosion knew how to wreck house quite well. She was a great offensive mon to use, but she wasn't the only one. Pitcher the Victory Bell, named after the species inspiration. Didn't get their Gen 2 Evo like the Oddish line did, but that didn't stop them from turning the world of Johto on its head when it came to dishing out damage. Well, at least poison type damage due to Victory Bell's physical base attack stat being much larger than their special, grass moves were about as strong as a wilted flower. Till I was able to set up a grass type hidden power on him that leveled the playing field quite well. 90 based power, whew. Otherwise, he would have had to use Giga Drain, which is about 60. I'm sorry, Victory Bell, not everybody can get Petal Dance. At least they became the new master of Sprout Tower, though. That was a fun little plot point. Bonsai the Sudowoodo. Named after the popular tree from which Sudowoodo takes its inspiration, was another hard-hitting attacker for the team. With moves like Rock Slide and Earthquake, they took down any obstacle in their way. Legends included, oof. Chikori, uh, I mean, Chicory, the mill tank, named after the favorite flower eaten by cattle, folded shit like it was laundry. Oh my god, poor, poor Morty. Rollout is a bitch when he gets started. I can totally see why a certain girl uses this as her main. Once you see this heifer for yourself, yeah, no, yeah, I get it. Jesus Christ, that move pool. Whitney was holding back. Snapdragon, the Red Gyarados, named after, obviously, the Snapdragon flower, was kind of underwhelming. I mean, sure, at the point where it's given to you, it pretty much just walls most of the later game Johto, and it does that very well. But after that, it just couldn't keep up. It just had no good stab damage due to water being a special type and Gyarados being physical. And that flying type might as well be decorative. Most of this, you know, was my fault for not planning a better move set. Gyarados is a monstrous Pokemon. Just, I don't know. I'd rather use the TMs that I could have used for it on other Mons and that really hurt it in the end. I'm sorry, Snapdragon. But speaking of snapping dragons, god damn, you, the Jinx, named after the winter flower, was unbelievably broken. Like honestly, whatever she didn't outspeed and put to sleep, she outsped one shot with psychic or ice beam, and if it did put you to sleep, she also rizzed you up, making it so that if you did wake up, you missed most of the time. Broken ass Pokemon. I was unaware of this beast till I played with it in like a playthrough before this, and I won just too many battles that I really shouldn't have due to her deadly combos. Also, you, like Yule Time Carol, or I'm in love with you, puns baby. Overall, a good team to start the retrospective with, and I had a lot of fun using some newbies and some old favorites. Let's see how the rest fare. Crystal, no naming theme, but a great team nonetheless. Starting off, we got Gotcha, the Feraligator, that I named after a toy I got on a school field trip like years ago. He was a Feraligator, he had good ice, dark, and water coverage, and was nice and bulky when I needed him to be. No notes. Just a straight, solid Pokemon. Parker the Ariados, named after the superhero Spider-Man, was a pretty decent Mon. Ariados isn't like the strongest, especially not if we look at other bug poison types, but they really do get the job done. I have never regretted using an Ariados in a playthrough. Give it the right attacks and some good statuses to spread around, and you got a solid Mon with the proper strategy. 
Weed Whacker Jr. Named after the expert HM user himself, the Weed Whacker family has been helping me for years behind the scenes. And every once in a while, a member of the family steps up to full team status. And when they do, they typically become the floral skirt turned saw blade blossom. And Junior was no different. Learning the dance of a thousand blades, pedal dance, from the Kimono Girls and Ecratique, or at least that's my head cannon, that's not actually how that went down, Junior became a defensive grass wall. And that was also like a makeshift chainsaw to deal with all the threats the team couldn't do by themselves. Junior really did their best to make their family proud, which they definitely did when they survived a blizzard from Red's team. Are you proud, Papa Weed? Muscle the Machoke was the muscle mommy the team needed when we got her from a trade in Goldenrod. Personally, I've always liked Machoke over Machamp. I just think its design is a lot stronger. So usually I just keep them at this stage. And Muscle made great use of her strength to carry the team to victory whenever they had to rely on her. Also, her ginger kept changing throughout the game. It started when we got her from that trade in Goldenrod when the trainer said male and then we got female. And I thought that was it, but it just kept changing like all the way through the adventure. Which hey, nothing wrong with that. I guess we just got a gender fluid muscle mommy. I seriously don't know how that kept happening. Scarlet the Sneasel was another unfortunately typed Pokemon for its stat spread. It had the speed, sure, but its stab types were both special while its stats were physical. Didn't stop her too much though with a powerful but inaccurate Iron Tail, Shadow Ball which was not just physical but also added in her role as the Psychic Blocker, Slash for obvious reasons, and Blizzard. Sure, she didn't have the stats, but a stab Blizzard with a Never Melt Ice is quite enough in most situations. Like Machoke, I actually tend to think Sneasel is a stronger, sleeker design than its evolutions. Maybe not better like Machoke to Machamp, but I do usually prefer my little cat, weasel, bird th What are you? Noodles, the Dragonite. It could go light speed, and anything that didn't get wrecked from that, it wrecked it with its absolutely mad stats. Though, I am kind of mad, personally, that I had to leave and then come back into the shrine to get him at level 15 at the end game. That kind of sucks, but it was worth it. This was a really fun team to use with a lot of classics that I've always liked, so you know you can't go wrong with that. It was a great time. Now, let's look at Soul Silver. We actually do have theme names for these guys, and if you can't tell, it's all Godzilla. I bet you can guess who our ace mon was. But first, let's talk support. By Elante the Meganium. Pitch perfect support. I will never get off the hill that Meganium isn't a bad starter. You guys just can't play her like she's a beat stick. I mean, you can, but that's just not her strong suit. With moves like Reflect and Light Screen to cripple the damage coming your way. Aromatherapy to cure the team's status afflictions. And then you got moves like Toxic, Attract, and Sleep to throw out your own status afflictions. Not to mention, they're bulky as fuck. This thing cripples idiots like Whitney or Lance, who are all power, no substance. If you don't like Meganium, it's because you don't understand how it plays. And that's probably why you have a lot of trouble with these two, and you're probably just bad at the game in general. Titanosaurus, the Ampharos, was a great Pokemon to have around. Especially with how she always had the best interactions in the overworld, including her little crush on Amphi in the lighthouse. Titano was a fun mon, and apparently female? I mean, Ampharos as Titanosaurus is already kind of a stretch of a parallel, so, you know, whatever. I personally am just still in shock that she managed to solo Mewtwo at such a lower level. And this was after we retired her for the second half of the journey. We brought her along for her flash skills and she decided to take a victory lap of her own. You go girl, god damn. King Caesar the Luxray replaced Titanosaurus in the post game. 
mostly because I wanted to show off other generations of Pokemon, kind of like how I used Spurt and Zatu last time. And I was going to use a magnetic trick to give Johto some Hoenn love, but I wasn't waiting a month for it. Ah, Luxray, the most dark type a non-dark type could look. The physical menace was a great electric boss to have on the team. Though he didn't beat Mewtwo solo, so Titano has that over him. Not to mention the hose. Uh, sorry, my edgy little boy, but you are more of a fan favorite. Kenya the Firo was a Pokemon I stole from these punks in Violet and Goldenrod. It was actually a lot better than I realized it would have been. I've always liked Firo as a fast attacker, but I never knew Mirror Move was so fun as a no you kind of mechanic. God bless, I loved using this bird. Also, yeah, I stole it, so I didn't have the chance to give it a Godzilla nickname. But like, there ain't a lot of birds in those games anyway, so like, what was I supposed to call it? Big Condor? Big Condor the Star Raptor replaced Kenya in the post-game Kanto Quest. Basically doing everything she did, but better and with close combat. Oh, Star Raptor, it's so good, bro. Really, I just wish it had that fighting flying type. That would have been perfect. And it also would have been perfect if I didn't have to train it up at level 12. That was a pain. But in every way else, this mon was perfect. And my Sinnoh loving heart loved all the Sinnoh mons I got to use for this playthrough. Baragon the Azumarill was cool. Yeah. I know Azumarill has like this crazy history as a spongy water type monster, especially in Gen 5, but here it was pretty decent. No complaints, just nothing else to add other than how ridiculously low that encounter rate is. I mean, I really never even realized I could actually get this mon in Johto for like the longest time. I always thought Ethan was just flexing on me, and maybe he was to be honest. Oh. Also, it's adorable. Just look at this dipshit. Behemoth the Mama Swine. Fuck yeah, now we're cooking. A pure power, not that kind, a pure power monster that snapped dragons and lesser mons alike with his powerful ground and ice stab. This time with physical support. Thank you, physical special split. And when he wasn't doing his best to prove himself as the monster of the frozen world, he was mentoring the next Mon and the ace of our team. God, Zuki. The Tyranitar. Yeah, I kind of blue balled you a bit on the name, right? Well, either way, the Prince of the Monsters wasn't just my personal vessel for the water. He was also the most powerful Mon we've used in the retrospective so far. I'm actually not kidding. Tyranitar as a Pokemon was pretty much built for the top of the ladder, and he stayed there pretty much from his introduction to modern day, where he's finally getting a little pushback. But honestly, Game Freak had to know what kind of monster they made, because he was impossible to get in the originals, and only could you get him with intense grinding at the tail end of the game. Lucky for Heart Gold and Soul Silver fans, we can actually get him at a reasonable time, meaning we get to fully experience his power. And yeah, he's got that dog, Zula, in him. There's a reason Game Freak spits out another rival for this badass every other gen. He's just too cool for school, too late for church, with his perfect rock and roll typing making him a beast. Though he does have an Achilles heel with that four times fighting weakness. But honestly, that's fine. He rules the meta anyway, truly becoming the king of all pocket monsters. Overall, probably the strongest team I made for this retrospective. I know, maybe we'll have something better later on, but for now, I don't know, this is pretty peak. And so were the rest of the teams in this video. I've already talked at length about Johto mons in general, so I'll save you the earful. Instead, let me just say that these teams were really fun to play through with, and I'd love to know what teams you recently rocked through Johto. Did you make any subs when you got to Kanto? I know I like to pull an Ash whenever possible, but that's enough from me. Thank you for watching everyone. Please support the channel in whatever way you feel comfortable with,
and I'll see you all next time when we take things to the next level of Pokemon battling at the Pokemon Stadium. See you then.